Hey, everybody, it's Market Marathon Press with another podcast today. Joining me is Keith Howe, a professional photographers of America judge. And I've always wanted to get into the head of a judge. And uh, today I'm going to pick on Keith. And uh, Keith is one of those great guys who has so many initials after his name from his degrees that he needs two business cards. So I'm just going to name a few of these here. Uh, PPA master, craftsman, uh, master artist, master of electronic imaging. Uh, I also, I know you don't have it yet, Keith, but it's just a matter of time. You'll get the new master's wedding photographer degree. Working so. toward it. Keith is also uh, a recipient of the PPA National Award, as well as the Service Award. And I know those are two in particular you're very proud of, Keith. But um, in addition to that, you have the, uh, the Gary Gentolf Award Good. and an honorary fellow life member of PPN and the Dave Sabota Award from the Greater Kansas City uh, PPA. So there's a ton more that I could list, but the whole blog would just be nothing but that. So basically, sounds like you're qualified, Keith. <laughs> I've been around for a while. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been a judge? Uh, let's see. I'm going to say since probably 90 or 91. I can't even imagine the amount of stories you must have. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've definitely seen a lot of prints and you've been part of the, you know, judging process, obviously, and as well as selecting the loan, which they now call the Image Excellence Award. And um, that's always been such an exciting part of it. And I know every photographer that ever starts to put together some images or look for some images, mm -hmm. they always want to figure out how's the best image to choose and how do you present it and there's so many ingredients that go into it so what i thought i'd do is uh fire away some questions at you and everybody that's listening know this these are not rehearsed so <laughs> everything we're doing here is just chatting back and forth so keith and i have not rehearsed this but um i am going to throw a number of questions at you and go quick so i'm going to put you on the spot are you ready i'm ready <laughs> okay Number one, what tips do you have on selecting images in your oh. own files or anybody else's files? Where do you begin? What do you look for? Oh, as far as where to begin, uh, I always recommend going through your images and look for images that are strong in storytelling and light direction. I'm making notes oh. as we go. Yeah. Dramatic lighting is a huge thing in whatever category you're in. Um, Landscapes, uh, such a difference between dramatic lighting and the wrong time of day, um, and it affects in the scores. Same thing with portrait work, wedding work, the whole thing is get that lighting down and that storytelling down. Good to know. Okay. Dude, there are some people that do um, client files or they do, um, they make something when they, they just create it for print competition. What do you think is harder? That's a hard one for me to answer because I do a lot of client photo photography. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it all depends on what kind of work you're doing. If I was a volume school photographer, sports photographer, um, church directories, I would want to probably do a lot of photographing specifically for composition. If I'm a portrait photographer, a wedding photographer, that kind of thing. I would be looking at client file, especially if you're on that wedding, new wedding degree. Uh, those files have to be from an actual wedding at the day. Uh, it's got to be within those time restraints to even count. And Good so it, it has to be a client. Okay. Excellent. Good to know. Okay. We're going to go on to number two. What are the most common mistakes you see in images that just miss out on the merit category? Um, too much information, meaning look for the image within the image and crop it in. Uh, easy example is we see a lot of times uh, landscapes that has a beautiful sunset sky, let's say over the mountain range reflected in a lake. And they show 
the whole lake and everything with the horizon line being right through the middle of the image. And then the question I always ask them is, what do you think is the most impactful? Is it the sunset over the mountains or is it the reflection? And crop it accordingly and move that horizon line out of the center. Anything through the center is boring. It's stagnant. Um, so get that horizon line out of there and determine what story you're trying to tell and work for it that direction. Excellent. The other thing I sometimes see too is people struggle with their matting. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, it's either too big and competes with the image or it's too, the density is incorrect for it. Um, and I think one of the things, even for myself at times, when I have an image ready, I'm, I'm like asking myself, first of all, does it need a mat? Because maybe not everything needs a mat. And uh, when I do a mat, um, do you find that there's like trends that kind of go with mats? What do you, as a judge, what do you look at? Um, less is more. You, you nailed it right off the bat. You don't want the presentation to distract from the image. But you do want to have presentation. You know, there are some images that are great as a full bleed. But reality is they can usually be improved with a little presentation. And presentation is one of the 12 elements. So if you go with no presentation, you've left out one of the 12 elements that you try to overcome. Um, what I recommend a lot of times in those situations is a very narrow presentation. So if you can envision on a actual physical print, it's easier to describe it for me that way. If you have a, if you're looking for a 16 by 20 inch physical print, if you put your presentation to be, oh, a quarter inch on all four sides. So essentially you're adding a half inch top and bottom or double that. And with a little simple stroke line, it very subtly frames the image, kind of finishes it. The stroke line tells us what's important with the image. So I sample from where I want the eye to go to. And that should be very narrow, uh, anywhere from three to five or six pixels usually, inside stroke. And then I try to view it at size. And if the stroke draws too much attention, I lessen it in its opacity. Uh, if it kind of fades away and you don't notice it, I'll let it come up a little stronger. But it should just be an accent, should just kind of tell you where to look without drawing your attention out to the sides. The, I'm going to call it the matte color of the framing. Mm -hmm. I always sample it from within the image. Uh, if it's an image that's got a lot of darks in it, I try to sample it from one of the darks and not just choose black. Uh, the reason is if you put a black mat on an image that is, doesn't have true blacks in it, it looks underexposed and milky. If you put a white mat on an image that it's, doesn't have pure whites, it again looks weak. So sample it from the image. And then that's the other thing I was going to say. A lot of people will put museum matting on the white mats. Rarely do I recommend that unless it's a purely high key image, because the amount of light reflecting out of that white space really distracts from the impact of that image when it first pops up. All right, well, let's go to number three. This is the tough one. Okay, out of twelve, out of the twelve elements of a merit print, and I'll put that in the blog. And assuming you do them all well, you know, we're not talking about some are great, some are bad, you know what I mean? What would you say takes a print to the next level most frequently? Impact. I agree. I agree. Now, the uh, downside to that is impact can be, you know, the initial impact when you see it, but it can also, the impact can come from all the other elements done really well, makes the impact rise up. 
Bye-bye. So impact can come from two directions. You know, it's um, funny. Uh, I was living in Missouri at the time, and I was judging at the Nebraska convention. And at the time, I didn't know it was yours. And there was a bride and groom that came around in a field. And it was one of those that just immediately made you go, holy cow, this is incredibly gorgeous. And the more you sat there looking at it, the more you felt that image even growing even more on you. And that was one of the few times I ever scored a print 100. And in fact, I think that's what it ended up scoring. I don't know if you remember that, but um, that was one of those. six once. I don't think I got 100 on a wedding. So Well, I tried. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I pushed. There was, I, I know there were three other judges with me that agreed, but um, I remember there was one who must have been out of his mind or her mind. I don't remember which, but, <laughs> but that's one of those images to this day. And that's been how many years ago? I still remember that image. It's still one of my favorites. So when you talk about impact, um, that definitely is a big part. Even when I look through my own images and I'm selecting images to choose, I find myself, I'll pull some. And if I come back to it a day later, I find myself going, yeah, that one still gets me. That one still, there's something about it. It may not be technically the way I want it yet, and it's not presented, but it definitely has that pop to it. Yep. Okay, number number four. Giving a title to an image is always challenging. How do you name your submission? Do you have a formula, or what do you recommend? I recommend if you're like me and you have a hard time naming files, you find somebody that's good at it and ask them, my wife is exceptional. <laughs> and so she names images for a lot of people all across the country. So uh, essentially, when I ask her that question, um, she said she looks at the image and tries to determine what the story is they're trying to tell and uses the title to expound on that. Um, or if it is an emotional image, she'll use that to come up with the title, you know, what the emotion it evokes. Um, if you can make the judges laugh, it's always good. Or if you can title an image so that in judging, they always announce the title, then the image comes up. So if you can title it so that it leads the judges to think they're gonna see one thing, and then the end is something totally opposite, Again, it adds impact to the image. So there's tricks, but each image is different. So there's not a formula. <laughs> I struggle, but I usually end up coming up with something. And here's how I do it. And I don't know if it works for somebody else, but I call it caveman titling. <laughs> what I do is I just start looking at my image and I'll write down the obvious things like landscape, old barn, cloudy, stormy, weathered. Um, brown, yellow, whatever it might be. And then I'll have that whole list of words. It's just a mind dump of what I immediately see. And then sometimes I just start putting the words together, thinking about the story, like you mentioned, and it, it somehow, some way comes together. The biggest struggle I have is like, if I'm entering like an abstract and wow, you know, what do you do there? Because <laughs> there's, there's not really anything to reference. And so that's probably why my, my abstracts don't do really well in print competition. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be the photography, Keith. Oh, no, never. <laughs> Gotta be the title. Can't be the photography. Okay, number six, should people take advantage of the PPA judges critique? Uh, in my opinion, yes. Um, I know judges that are still taking advantage of the critiques all the time because it gives you another unbiased view of the image. As, as a maker, we are emotionally involved in it. And so it's harder to step back and see everything from a fresh concept. So when you get somebody else to come in and take a look at your image, especially the judges that are used to uh, analyzing an image very quickly, you see 
things that stand out maybe that you missed. Uh, sometimes it's a little dust spot down in the corner. Sometimes it's a, a piece of grass that needs to be taken out because it distracts from where your image is at. Uh, but any of those things that just helps you out to help you learn to visualize your images too. Uh, when we do the critiques, we're trying to look at them based off the 12 elements and try to tell you the things that you've done good, which elements, and then what things could be uh, worked on to maybe help that image go a little higher. The other side of the critiques is it is one person's opinion and a judging panel is five people's opinion. So you will get some variances, but it is definitely worth it. It's great to have a resource like you and those that do this kind of mentoring and judging to kind of help people understand it's not scary it's helpful and um, you can benefit from it well we're about out of time here keith so i want to thank you so much for doing this conversation and podcast with me because i've been a great admirer of your work for a long time and you've been such a good mentor to so many people over the years and that's why i'm particularly happy that you agreed to do this keith if people want to get a hold of you how can they reach you uh you can email me at imager410 at hotmail.com i am a g e r 410 at hotmail.com excellent uh, keep in mind, I won't be able to look at specific images if you're going to enter them this year. Good point. Because Good point. I don't want to have to DQ myself when they come around. Yep. But you could send them to my wife at that same email address, just, you know, note to Holly. And yep. she can give opinions that doesn't have to involve me. Okay. And I'm available at markw at marathonpress.net, or you can call me at 800-228-0629, extension 283. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Keith, thank you again so much. Well, thanks for having me.